Okay. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in uh, to Art Tells a Story. My name is Jordan Bell. I work at Columbus College of Art and Design. Um, I have two roles there. I, I teach some classes and I also work in career services where we help students prepare for life after college. And part of that role is also putting on our semi-annual art fair, which is where I get to know uh, today's guest, Leah Gray, who's a fine arts alum from 2004. Uh, and Leah is a big hit at our art fair. So when we thought about talking about how do you run a business as an artist and what are all the different things you need to juggle, uh, Leah is the perfect candidate for that. Uh, so I'll let Leah explain. Leah, why don't you start by introducing yourself and letting us know about what your business is and, and what your craft is. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be a part of this opportunity. Um, so thank you for inviting me. Um, I run a business making paper flowers, succulents, uh, plants, trees, anything you find in nature. And I also teach what I do as well. Um, so basically, and in, in during the fall and Christmas and all that, I will make a lot of products. But throughout the year, I do recreations of people's wedding bouquets. I'll also create wedding bouquets for uh, live weddings, of course, and uh, just lots of different gifts um, and products and things developed that are one of a kind custom pieces that people request. Uh, um, so that's kind of how it works. And then I also do large installations for residential and, and businesses. Uh, part of like um, just sort of like an interior installation with wall gardens where the live plant gardens are very big right now, but I make them out of paper. They still look real, but they don't need to be watered. Um, so I have lots of different components to my business. And I remember seeing a photo of one of your installations. It's, it's kind of like what's behind your shoulder, right? But on a much bigger mm -hmm. scale, is that? Yes. And so would, yeah. it, would you want to explain a little bit more about what goes into that? Uh, yeah, so actually, well, I've got a succulent right here. Um, so I make these paper succulents and then I have a very large or just like the one behind me, if you can see it in um, like box frames. And then I just fill it up with like a faux soil. And then I create all of the paper elements, all the succulents and plants that go into it and sort of arrange it with light coming out of dark. And then um, that is installed in an area where you know, they purposeful for that installation. And so I'll work it into uh, businesses where there's UV and water resistant protectant on it. Um, so the dust doesn't stick very well. And over time, the humidity is not going to um, curl the paper or anything like that. And also the UV rays are not going to change the, the colors. And you can kind of see some of the work is real shiny too, um, and some of it's matte, but regardless of how it shows up, it's it's protected um, from the elements. So let's work our way up to this wild roller coaster every year that we're in right now. But first talk about how did you establish yourself as um, as an artist business and what what did it look like, you know, up until 2020, up until the whole pandemic hit? Um, and then we'll jump into how things were changed and new opportunities that came up. But first, let's establish, how'd you get started? Okay, cool. Um, I was an origamiist for a while or thought of myself as one because I was so passionate about um, paper as a medium, but also the magic of origami and um, learning the folds and the meditativeness, um, I guess that's a word, um, mm -hmm. behind and just repetitive folding um, was just very interesting to me, but it got boring over, over time because I wasn't creating my own designs, I was creating other people's designs. And um, one day somebody came to me and said, well, if you can make origami, would you, would you be able to make flowers, actual flowers that look real out of paper? And I was like, let me see. And um, so I made my first bouquet and it was like 30 hours <laughs> or something of like overnight, just nonstop. And I was so integrated in the process and so passionate and so excited that I was like, this is a business. This is what I'm going to do. Because uh, obviously I, I already had paper as a medium that I really enjoyed, um, but it just felt like there was a whole world of being able to create that it honestly still to this day, eight years later, never ends. I still have 
plants and flowers I haven't designed yet. So there's always a challenge around the corner and that's what keeps me going. So you started by responding to requests for that and then was it word of mouth? How did you grow into, you know, making that into a, a consistent uh, following, not just a few kind of one-off freelance type of um, gigs? Sure. It, you know, I did run an Indiegogo to start out with, which, you know, it, it garnered a little bit of attention and um, a little bit of some backing there. But honestly, it, it took a bit of time of just trusting the process and um, continuing to be seen, um, whether it was just ex using my website to gain exposure or um, locally. So anytime I, I did something like an exhibition or um, like the CCAD event, it just kind of built on that. And honestly, I haven't done anything really big, um, including the CCAD art cell, only within the last two years. I, I was so busy with running my business and it just takes so much to run all the different components. Um, so I just am able to now run all, all the different parts, but it, it really did grow uh, word of mouth um, slowly but surely. And now uh, the exposure is starting to get more and more and more. I have people who will type in uh, paper because that's the first part of your anniversary for tradition. So there's like paper, wood, and like for, for the first year it's paper. So they'll type in paper flowers and I will come up in their search because I have a lot of paper flowers on my website. All that alt text, meta tags, and SEO is integrated very well so much that I, I get a lot of um, exposure from that. Yeah, you mentioned recreating bouquets. So do you have to like work off a photo? And, yes. <laughs> okay. What's the yeah. oldest bouquet you had to do? <laughs> um, that's funny. I did it about seven years ago. I was still fairly new in my business and it was from the eighties and it was a, it was one of the cascading. Um, so it was a very long bouquet of, of gardenias. And um, that was a very special experience because it was the first time I actually got a, um, a large, piece to create it wasn't one of these little tiny ornaments or you know it just felt like it i had graduated in in my um abilities to create um on, on a large scale format um so yeah it was from the 80s so it was kind of That's funny really cool. for me to create it yeah because i mean i wouldn't come up with that design now but he really you know wanted to make her feel special and that's what recreating the bouquet is all about because people will buy and put all the money into the bouquet and then it, it's thrown away the next day. There's no preservation. And then, so mm -hmm. I just come in and recreate it as close to possible as I possibly can. That's awesome. Yeah, it must be challenging with those older weddings with grainy photos and there might not be a whole lot of photos of it. Nowadays, you get a close up photo of it and it's yeah. Free, free. Yeah, um, yeah you mentioned there's lots of challenges. Yeah, oh, sorry. you mentioned all the, uh, all the different components of running a business and let's just brainstorm together what those are. So obviously you need to market your business. Um, there must be some kind of like the kind of non-creative side of like managing money and inventory and things like that. What are, what are all the parts of a business that go beyond the glamor of, you know, creating in your studio and setting them out and seeing yeah. how happy people are when they get your product? It's honestly, there are some boring components as anybody would know. Um, one of them would be not that photography is boring, but I do take all my photography. Um, I did build my own website. I built my own logo. I do all my business cards and all that. I basically build everything on my own. And that's kind of what causes a little bit of disruption in my flow because I'm taking on so much. Um, and, you know, that comes with starting a business, you kind of do have to do everything on your own at first until you start to get bigger. Um, but I'm just kind of used to it by now, um, handling all of the things. And of course, money. Um, I had somebody to design um, a Microsoft Excel format so that when I plug something in, because to be honest with you, for maybe the fi first five years of my business, I wasn't doing that. And I think I, I wouldn't say I failed a lot, but I had lost my ability to um, see what was going out and coming in. And sometimes that would cause problems um, 
bringing in new projects? Well, you have to have the ability to get the materials and, and have everything. And so you're just kind of sitting and waiting there, waiting for new projects, more new projects to come, if that makes any sense. Um, there's a disruption and flow there. And, and that's kind of what I experienced at the beginning of COVID where I wasn't really sure how to make those projects happen because I had depleted uh, part of my financials to uh, make things make things work during that first part of the, the lockdown. Yeah, at CTAD, we always talk about kind of the art side and the design side in, which isn't really an official designation, but you think of like an artist being a solo practitioner and a design opportunity being like more working on a team. And when you're working on a team, there's a clear pipeline that things have a beginning, middle and end. And there are different members of the team that might handle different parts mm -hmm. of that pipeline, but it's all you. It's all when you're the, on the artist side, that's everything. You need to be responsible for generating new business and then making sure you have the materials for that new business and then making sure it gets out on time and all and those. And photographing are. it and then putting it on social media which is where my assistant comes in. I um, had to bring her in as of last year because I just, I had too many projects running at the same time. And then I had the CCD art cell, which is a very big sale for me. And so bringing her in just to do the laborious stuff, like the, the groundwork that's not the final design or the painting of the parts and pieces, just running the machines, um, doing the work that, actually she really enjoys doing. And so without her, I don't know where I would be because there is a lot of times where there's just no way I can handle 2000 succulents on top of a bouquet recreation and a class that weekend. There's just, I can't, <laughs> I only, I'm not an octopus, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned classes and you mentioned teaching before. Um, wh where are you teaching and how often are you teaching? Well, right now I am teaching through Zoom and then I actually have a bachelorette party that's coming on Sunday in my home. And we decided that because we couldn't find a venue um, that it would be safe to come here as long as I was able um, to practice all the, the, you know, the standards, the new standards. And um, they were delighted because there's a lot of places that are not offer, offering that ability. Um, but so I am teaching out of my home and I don't really leave my home very much. So I work from home. I, my studio is here. So we felt it was, was a, a good solution for the problem at hand. Um, but now I'm doing a lot more zoom than normal, uh, just based on the circumstances of going on, what's going on in the world. Yeah. And so before the pandemic hit, uh, were you still doing a lot of virtual teaching or was it mostly in person? I was not doing any virtual teaching at all. <laughs> um, everything was in person and I have a clubhouse out of my um, apartment complex that I work out of, which is, is very, very nice, uh, very nice venue. And so I just invite everybody to come there and I was working with different venues for a while, but I found that it was a little bit easier for me to host my own classes. And I had a lot more control on um, how those went down. So I started to slowly but surely pull myself away from venues and just um, still doing every once in a while, but mostly here. Mm -hmm. So for our students listening that are looking forward to a, at a semester remote, as a teacher, do you have any tips for them on how they can make the most out of remote education? Because I think when we think of art, we think that's really hard to teach virtually, but you've been doing it. And how, how have you seen students getting the most out of it? So two things, um, one, you have to um, realize, obviously there's no hands-on. And when I teach my classes, I do get in there and I do ensure that everybody's piece comes out perfect just by assisting them if, if need be. So um, I, know, I know that's an obvious one, but that was something that was hard for me to get over because I really, uh, that's what makes my classes and the students that take my classes, the experience is so special because it's like I can get in there and help them out and, and work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so being like this, it's it takes so much patience because you really have to give direction over and over. And because everybody learns different audio-wise, audio like um, with audio and visual, there's no kinetics. So basically, uh, you have to kind of format yourself with each and every person. And if there's a class of 10, 
well, you're going to be asked by multiple people at a time, what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, and you kind of have to just feel out how they need to be responded to. Um, so it takes a little bit of getting used to. And yeah, patience is a huge thing with Zoom um, and teaching art. There's just no way around it. Um, the other component to that is um, you can create a video tutorial on your own. Um, I've created two, which are 30 minutes long, actually three, I just haven't released the third one yet. Uh, 30 minutes long and it's just me with uh, the camera down and it's just my hands and I'm working with the, the tools and materials. And at the beginning of the tutorial, I talk about um, what is in the materials that you would need. And so I create a kit and then I show what's in the kit. And then I talk about how to make uh, what I'm, uh, what the tutorial is. And then I send the tutorial out for free because then people get to watch it and see, is that gonna be hard? Do I wanna make it? Is that interesting? If they watch it and they wanna order the kit, then I sell my kits for 35 to 50 bucks. And then they can um, create like what I, what the tutorial is about. So where can they find the tutorials? Uh, they're all on my website. And then if you join my group, I have a group on Facebook called Paper Blooms Design Classes. Um, and if you go on there and join my group, there are two free tutorials pinned at the top and uh, you can watch them and order through Facebook. Um, you can just message me. Uh, that's kind of how I'm running it now. Cool. Yeah, and your website's paperbloomsdesigns.com, right? Design without an S, yes. So right. paper blooms, um, B L O O M S, and then design.com. So let's put ourselves in like the end of 2019. What percentage would you say your business was online and what percent was selling in person or um, the, you know doing events like art fairs and festivals and things like that? I think it was it would be 30 70 so 30 percent presence online and then 70 in person I, I very I was very locally um, kind of integrated um, and so and that was also dependent on the CCAD art cell I just did um, that's just like a huge amount of exposure that you honestly um, you can't buy that exposure you can't buy that kind of advertising and I sold so much work after the art cell um, I sold two very, very large pieces of mine uh, that somebody had seen at the art cell and they contacted me four months later when they were ready for it. And um, so it just ended up working out great. And that's why I'm in love with that experience because it's been very good for me. So when March, 2020 happened and everything was shutting down, what, what were your first thoughts? What was your reaction to you to this year for your business? I'm going to be vulnerable for a second. I'm going to choose to be vulnerable. And I'm mm -hmm. going to say I cried because I was scared. And I thought that I was going to lose everything. I thought I was going to lose my home. Um, I have a studio inside of my home. And, um, you know, the overhead for that is, is not, you know, cheap whatsoever. And I have a garage that I work out of. So there's lots of different pieces to make this business successful. And, and so I just remember how I felt. And um, I also remember that I decided I was going to get a job with Instacart. Uh, it was gonna be easier for me to run groceries for people during that time so that I didn't have to think about what was or wasn't gonna come in because I'd, I had no idea. I'd, there was no way to have any expectation at that point what was going to happen um, and to kind of segue into what actually happened, if that's okay. Um, yeah. I um, experienced quite a positive outcome and surprise. Um, I had this idea that I should make a tutorial and put it out there for free um, because everybody's going through a rough time. And maybe if I, show them something that they could create from their homes that was like positive and fun, um, that maybe everybody would feel good and, and um, join in. And that's exactly what happened. I, mm -hmm. I put the tutorial out there and I must have sold close to 40 kits um, in that first month. And it blew me away because 
that basically paid for everything. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to be all right. And um, from that point, I just sort of trusted that, you know, I think I'm supposed to stay here and I think everything's going to be fine. And, you know, when you run a business for eight years, you honestly go through every roller coaster, every turn up and down. So I've been through so much that honestly, I, I guess I wasn't that frightened, but it still kind of put me in a place where I was like, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a brand new thing that just happened to all of us. So mm-hmm. I don't think anybody knew what was going to happen. Yeah. And in one way or another, we all went through that same evolution, March, April, and May of like being really scared and then, okay, I think I can do this. And then now it's kind of new normal. And mm-hmm. now being, you know, close to six months in to that, I'm sure your whole business is flipped and, you know, that 30, 70 is probably a hundred percent online um, now. So what, let's talk through some of those uh, challenges and what opportunities they brought up and how it made you need to pivot your business? Um, yes, pivoting my business. Well, um, one of the things that happened um, to help me gain a lot of online exposure is I had uh, the release of an episode of a TLC program um, called Dragnificent. And um, so that was filmed in November and the release was in May. So I was very lucky to have that because that that month and the following months after still now, I get phone calls um, because they're like, I saw your stuff on TV and my wife is in love with your work and we have an anniversary coming up. I'm so sorry, it's two weeks away. <laughs> and um, so that's brought in a, a huge presence to me. So I just kind of got lucky there with timing, um, which was really nice. And as far as everything else goes, um, Somehow I'm just, what I think was what happened is everybody's at home, not going out as much because, you know, they're, they're trying to be careful. And I think that's the way to be. Um, But because everybody isn't out there spending a lot of money, they have money. And then they're sitting on their phones shopping, they're looking through things and, um, or their iPads or whatever. And I think, I think people are wanting to buy custom pieces more um, because they have the money and they're not going out. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Uh, The trade-off is really nice. And on top of that, another thing I'm experiencing is I've got a lot of weddings coming in uh, where I'm creating bouquets because they had to cancel their wedding due to the pandemic. And it was, they can't have over, you know, a certain amount of people. So They'll call me and say, well, I'm, I'm having a 10 person ceremony, but because we're canceling everything now, I have all this money freed up. So I was wondering to make it special, to make it magical. I wanted to have something real cool created and I saw your work. And um, so they have a different affordability uh, because things have changed monetarily with them um, and freed up some of those finances. So for me, it's, it's another positive turnaround because um, just so happens that uh, people are looking at their weddings differently in that aspect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'm not sure if every customer gives you a reason for their order, but one thing that was a weird opportunity that kind of came up was uh, everyone. The new kind of game in town is what's behind you on your Zoom call. You know, like whenever you're <laughs> on a conference call, you're like, oh, cool artwork or a bunch of books or like everyone's trying to like look inside everyone's house. So I'm sure. As like I, we just moved into a house in January and we have bare walls everywhere. So yeah. when we're doing these Zoom calls, we're like, we got to decorate. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of people were looking <laughs> at their bare walls and thinking they got to keep up. I don't know if anyone gave you that feedback, but I'm sure your pieces are in the background of some meetings now. They are, you know, and honestly, I've done so many recreations and I think that that is the magic um, there again. It's sort of like we want to have something on display and we love your work and it'll forever commemorate that special day we had that, you know, with our wedding. And so whether it shows up in Zoom calls, I don't know. I mean, that would be great advertisement for me. Maybe I'll I'll send them like a little plaque to go next to it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well. so. Now our audience can be on the lookout next Zoom call you're on. Look behind the shoulder. <laughs> yes. um, so, you know, I wanted to talk about, you know, what your business looked like before so that we can compare it to what it looks like now. And, what, you know, you mentioned like the art sale and when, you, when you're when you out there that you make sales at an event like that, but really the marketing 
brings in so much more business. And then you don't have that when you have to work from home and you can only do online sales. But I guess it was a, a very serendipitous that that TLC uh, yeah. episode of uh, Dragnificent that you were on came out at a time when you really, that's the only way you could get exposure was if, you know, a, a TV show had you on. Um, are Were there other ways that you were looking at now I need to find new ways to get my name out there and, you know, how, how did you think about that? Or were you fortunate enough to have established your business enough that it's kind of self-running now? You don't, you don't need to be looking for those exposure opportunities as much as maybe you did early on. It's, it's been quite strange this year because honestly, I keep getting surprised with phone calls and orders um, that I didn't expect. And a lot of it is that SEO meta tag, alt text kind of thing. Um, because I ask them every time. I mean, I want to know like how they're finding out about me. And a couple of the sales this year have been word of mouth. Um, it just was like a trickle effect. Um, somebody bought a bouquet. They had it on their dining room table. They put it on their Instagram. Somebody had an anniversary, saw it on the Instagram, was like contacted me. Um, the person he works for was like, I'm opening up a new uh, dental lab. And, and um, so I want really big pieces in uh, my facility. And so it just sort of that trickle effect um, locally. But then um, aside from that, going back to uh, the meta tags, um, if you do type in succulent um, on Google images and you click on it, I think within two or three pages, my work will pop up because I have succulent on my site so many times, there's just no getting around it. And it's my Etsy page will pop up. And then on top of that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the paper flowers, um, when people are typing in paper flowers, my website will come up because paper flowers is on there, or just even the word flowers is on there so many times. Um, so when you're thinking of, you know, people searching for things, you want to make sure you have that repeated word so that it, it just automatically comes up. Now, I'm not in Google searches. My website doesn't come up on the first page, but if you look through imagery um, and, and website search, I'll come up with, I think, within the ten, first 10 pages. Um, yeah, you know, um, also you, you mentioned weddings so much. I feel like wedding wedding sort of culture is almost its own thing. Uh, it, have you found like you're getting shared on like, you know, sites for, uh, for people's weddings? Like, look at what I did. I'm sure that's a big way for you to get exposure is when people, when someone's having a wedding, they're going to do a lot of searching to see what other people did and what works and what mm -hmm. doesn't work. I think it's a, a niche market, honestly. And it's so strange. It is such a big market, but it's still kind of underground. Um, so the thing about it is it's like, if it was like, if if celebrities were like holding paper wedding bouquets, then I think it would be much, much bigger. But we're still as a community coming up and um, we're still being exposed. And I think people more than ever are searching for new ways to create a memorable experience and have something to hold on to. Because like I said, most people throw away those bouquets and they put so much money in them. Why not? Um, spend more and have it a lifetime. And um, so with that said, I mean, it's honestly, it, it feels like um, with the wedding market, it is, it is still making its rounds. I could say maybe in the next two years, it will be a trend for sure. It's really, really happening. And with my work, I think what makes it so special is I try to make it as real as possible. I really don't want it to look like it is actually paper. I actually have a bouquet right here um, that I'm working on. And if you can actually see, mm -hmm. I try to create yeah. all the little details and things um, that are happening to kind of fool the eye. Mm -hmm. And so I really honestly, the niche part where it's like people are looking for paper bouquets, I'd rather them want to because they want it to look real but they just want it to last forever that's my there are a lot of paper flower makers out there that are okay with the paper look but i just i'm trying real hard to just i want it to fool the eye mm -hmm. yeah no it certainly does uh, that looks beautiful and Thank um it's, it's hard to tell in you know around you what's what's real plan and what's not and that's the, <laughs> yeah, the, that's the quality yeah that's, that's good. on purpose <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Weddings are so unique. It's like, it's one of the few opportunities that you like, you really want to impress your friends and family with like something new, something fashionable and new. You know, you think about the table design, the bouquet, the attire, there's so many visual elements to it. Um, I feel like that's what propels all of these new things that what, what's going to be the next big hit at weddings. Um, it yeah. must make you think about like, if this, takes off you want to be thinking about the next thing what's going to be cool in five or ten years um i don't know if you've thought about that like what the next phase of your business might be or the next type of thing you work on or if you're just going to ride this out as long as it'll go (laughs) i think it's already kind of happening on its own um honestly i really think the wall gardens are going to just be a huge thing i think it's just going to keep happening um because i think live wall gardens are already a trend and moss um, gardens, you know, pre- preserved moss gardens. And so with my work, it does look real, but it doesn't need to be taken care of. And there's such a, a meaning behind handcrafted. Um, somebody made that? Oh my God, I thought it was real. And so it just kind of changes. I don't know how many people, um, you know, not to toot my own horn, but it is kind of funny. And I, I love this, but at the CCD art sale, People will come up and they'll look at my sign and they'll say, why does it say paper blooms? Like, what does that mean? And I, I just go, oh, well, it's paper. And they're like, oh, my God, I thought that these were real. And it's sort of that moment of laughter that brings joy to uh, both me and, and that um, customer. And, uh, you know, that's kind of what's shifting in this idea of these massive wall gardens, um, you know, where I. I'm looking into doing a signage for um, businesses where their logo is lit up within a bunch of my paperwork. Create, if it's a grocery store, I'm going to do kale and spinach and uh, make it look like it's real, but then it's paper. And, um, or I've had some businesses just order floral gardens that just hang on the wall that look real, but they're just in a frame and it looks real, but it's not. Uh, and so it just makes it fun and um, it's something unique it's it's handmade art but it's workable in the environment um, because of the way that I I protect it and whatnot Mm -hmm. Uh, so I just think that's going to keep rolling and even wedding walls I can see that being a thing where I create a a large wedding wall that you can um, rent out because obviously people don't want to pay five thousand dollars for a a large wall for the wedding and then that's it Um, maybe somebody out there will that's cool Uh, you know call me but um, being reasonable and understanding the climate that I'm working in and as far as um, locality I I really have to understand my demographics and for um, a rental it makes sense because they'll bring it back and then uh, but they'll have that beautiful presence and again it it changes the dynamics when you find out it's handmade it's not just faux flowers at that point it becomes a conversational piece of like oh my god that's so cool uh it's just different you know yeah that's such an innovative way to think about you know expanding who can access your work by you know thinking about rentals instead of of owning you know that that opens up a whole uh, group of people that otherwise they wouldn't, you know, be able to pay uh, to own it, but they certainly want to take advantage of having it in their environment and, and renting it. Um, have you done that, or is that a, a thought that you're a future thing you want to try? I'm definitely working on it. I think there's going to be a lot of things to kind of work out as far as um, contracts and waivers, because you know, if it gets damaged, what 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 are we going to do? Um, that aspect of the other aspect that came to mind when we were talking about that is that's kind of why um, I wouldn't say the main reason why I teach classes. Um, I, I love teaching classes because I love sharing the joy I have in creating with others. So that's the main reason. But when somebody wants to build their own wedding bouquet or um, come up with a way to kind of make it work for them, then yeah, by all means. I mean, I I have kits and things and I have different ways of um, teaching. So if they wanted to make their own wedding bouquet, I, I, you know, paper flowers are a thing in the world that you can learn how to create. And I don't, I don't hold back. I I want people to um, experience whatever they want, however they get there, if you know what Mm -hmm. I mean. I meant to ask this earlier, but is this a technique that you 
came up with organically or when you were first learning to do this, did you learn from someone else who was doing it? Was it passed down to you or did you have to kind of make it up as you go? Definitely both. And mm. that's why it's so easy for me to share because a lot of the the parts and pieces that have built my business, I've learned techniques off of others, which gives me the full ability to share it too. It's sort of like, that's kind of what comes with the territory. When you learn off of somebody else, you, you really you really are allowed to share it. Now, some of my designs as in succulents, that's all my groundwork. Um, when we're talking about bonsai trees and moss, um, any of the designs that are, are very much my own, um, eventually I'm going to come out with a book with all of those parts and pieces on how to create those designs. Because again, I, I still wanna share, but those really are my designs. Those really are, that's all the groundwork that I laid. Um, the pains and processes it goes through just to come out with, you know, what this actually looks like, um, that is my own. Um, so yeah, both, and really the succulent came out of learning how to make a flower. And so I just switched the paper and then switched the color. And then, so really at the end of the day, um, yes, a lot of the work is my designs, but um, it, a lot of those techniques and stuff were, they were learned. Yeah. And I, I think we don't think of, you know, when we think of being an artist, we kind of think about we're on our own and we want to not have competition. We want to be the only game game in town, but there's a lot of benefits of helping to curate your community. I'm sure when you teach uh, students and then you see what they create, it, it, you know, you're just kind of creating a, a creative atmosphere and who knows what comes out of that. Those are the, a that's lot. the great thing to part is that you just kind of, these sparks fly and who knows what's going to catch on. Yeah, if you really try to hold on to everything and you really try to be secluded, I don't think there's anything wrong. However, there's a lot more exposure in creating that community. And when I'm in my classes, they get to see my personality and, and, and know it and they get to be with that. And my personality, I mean, my work is an extension of me. Um, so because they experience that, I'll, maybe if it's six months or a year down the road, they think of me when a birthday comes along. They're like, oh yeah, she she creates that. And even though I learned how to create it, I would love for her to customize a piece because uh, I know she'll put her heart into it because that's how she taught the class. You could tell when I'm teaching, my heart is in it. Um, but creating that community, uh, it, yeah, and there's a lot of exposure. But when you give, you definitely get. That's a big one. So um, I'm kind of jumping all around here. We're just kind of bouncing around. I want to kind right. of go back to uh, the, you know, when the pandemic hit and we're all remote, um, you must have seen, you must have thought I need to revisit my website. I, I need, I'm hundred percent online now. So all my business is going to go through there. Um, what, what were some of those concerns about like, you know, uh, doing business online and, and shipping things and kind of, uh, there's a lot of logistics that happen with an online business that, uh, maybe when it was a smaller part of your operation, uh, you didn't have to think about daily, but like, what were some of those new challenges and opportunities that came up with being online almost exclusively? Definitely um, shipping was a big deal. Shipping of my products and getting my supplies shipped. So um, one of the biggest things I ran into because the pandemic hit, um, USPS wasn't as reliable and the other um, shipping places. And so what happened is if I had something that was due and I had to ship it out because the, the shipping times were unexpected and delayed, I would have to expedite my materials in. Um, and so I had to eat that cost because I'm not gonna charge my client something after the fact when I already placed it or agreed upon a quote. So um that came with it. And then also sometimes I wouldn't get the supplies at all. It would just be like two weeks later and I would have to reorder and cancel that order because it just never arrived only to find like a month later, it finally came in. Uh, so there were a lot of um, challenges there and then also shipping my work. I mean, it. Um, I told you that there were some challenges with that. And throughout my eight years of running my business, I've had some ups and downs with shipping, but um, this was the time to really get down and find out, okay, let's just, you know, find something across the board that's going to work. Cause I, I think I was doing it different every time. Um, like I'd ship a bouquet and that was different to like a glass piece that I had. 
And um, the only thing I needed was the easiest thing in the world was peanuts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it makes me laugh because it's such a simple thing. And the only reason why I didn't do it is because they're expensive. Um, it, at the end of the day, that expense is kind of factored in. And so I raised my prices a little bit as far as shipping um, to, you know, balance that out. But um, ultimately, that's what made me run away from it. Because I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm not spending $15 on a bag of peanuts. I don't think people know when you get peanuts in the mail. Um, in, in shipping, you, you look at it, you just think, oh, they're peanuts and you just throw them out. Well, that, I mean, and that's funny. I even mentioned that everything I get shipped in here on my supplies, I keep all that packing material and I reuse it, which is a great way to recycle, but it saves you so much money. Um, I don't reuse boxes that have logos on it because I think that that's not really professional, uh, but the packing materials, oh yeah, I reuse those. Yeah, it must be the the volume because it weighs nothing, but it probably takes up so much space on a truck or a plane that shipping it must be. God. It's you know, and and when you when you're uh, sending okay, like an orchid plant, one of my orchid plants, you have to think about the height of that thing, mm -hmm. and then you have to put you have to factor in so much of the peanuts around it, and then you have to um, gosh. Sending that orchid out last month was <laughs> it was a challenge, and um, it took me at least two hours to pack it. But ultimately, if you take the time and um, you think about things in terms of like, even if you put the the label fragile on it, every U UPS, every USP worker, all of those places, they'll tell you the same thing. That doesn't mean anything in that game. They literally will just chuck that stuff around. So you really have to pack it properly. Um, some of my stuff did arrive a little bit damaged and I just sent them new stuff out. I mean, that's what you have to do. Um, made a couple of claims there, but that those two things were uh, the biggest things that I ran into as far as challenges um, going online, more of an online presence. Yeah, you know, when you start to go down that rabbit hole of like, what are all the little moving pieces? It's even something like you mentioned you know, delivery driver not paying attention to the label. And then you have to remember, they we've been hiring so many delivery drivers because everyone <laughs> shipping stuff that someone might be brand new and, you know, tossing your stuff around. That's, you know, there's a lot of little things that, that uh, happen. Have you found a trick to uh, being able to pack, keep costs down on packing and keep the product safe that might help someone else that is also creating things that are fragile, might have glass in it or be, you know, paper. You don't want the paper to get bent or you know, things like that. So um, there are some different things. Definitely the peanuts. That's a big one. You could do the the ones that dissolve, the biodegradable ones. Those are, um, I think, a little bit more than the the other kind of peanuts. Um, so definitely that. Um, I like those little pillows, uh, those little air filled pillows that you get. Uh, usually, when you order something on Amazon, they'll they'll put something like that in um, some of the boxes. So definitely save everything that you get shipped in, save all that stuff. Um, gosh, have I mean, you had just, to order? I, have you had to order that. supplies your own, or has it just all been recycled? Because I don't even know where you order peanuts. Do you go to like the UPS store and say eBay. I want? Some eBay? Yeah, if you go to Staples, they're probably going to charge a little bit more than what I would want to pay I, personally. Um, I hit up eBay. I mostly uh, use Amazon when I'm buying all my supplies, even art supplies, because a lot of the stuff that I create, um, you can find that stuff on Amazon, which is amazing because it comes in a day. Um, but eBay, I'll usually go there for like slashing prices of things that I don't need the next day. Um, so those two sources are great for me. And I was gonna mention something else about packing and it was, oh, I know what it is. Okay, so you kind of wanna create a little disclaimer. And as far as my business goes and how I do things, I like to be classy with my presentation. So I like tissue paper and all those things. But if you create like a little card that just has a message on it, it says, Thank you so much for your purchase. Uh, during shipment, this item may be um, moved around a bit, so you'll have to do some fluffing. I have a special wording that I use, but basically I'm just preparing them. When they open that box, um, they have this little card that just gives them a, a kind of like um, 
be prepared. I don't know what you're going to find inside. And it's not worded like, hey, it's probably going to like be broken in a million pieces. <laughs> but it's a it's sort of like a classy way of saying, um, look, this item was shipped. So let's just have the expectations that some things might be moved around a bit. And you'll have to kind of like pull out some of the, the paper. I mean, the paper is delicate. And um, so I use a lot, a lot of spray to make it as durable as possible. But at the end of the day, like I said, uh, some people I've seen them, I've seen them just throw boxes and you can't, uh, you can't do anything about that. So if you have that little disclaimer in there, uh, that sets them in the right mindset. So when they open it up, they're like, oh yeah, she did tell me. And um, then at the end of it, I say, if anything is needs to be replaced, please uh, hold on to the packaging and take a picture. And then that way they can get back to me right away and say, this is definitely broken. This glass is broken. And then I make a claim with USPS or UPS, whichever shipping I, I use. And um, that's a different way to handle things is uh, mm -hmm. making a claim. Yeah, you know, we talk a lot with students when they're preparing for the art fair about the kind of customer experience and you know a card like that is is not just good guidance for them but it also reminds them that like there's a person behind the product and you can get in touch with that person and i'll help make it okay if you didn't have that card they would just think like oh it broke and that's a sunk cost and i'll just never order from that person again but yeah. you take that moment and now you've kind of built some customer loyalty because they know there's someone that can help support me if i do need to you know fluff it up or something even worse happened with it yeah, and just to piggyback on what you said, even handwriting that card, if you if it is handwritten, then that's even better because then at that point they're like, oh, that's the actual artist. She actually signed it. Um, and a lot of times, anyways, they're talking to me directly on the phone. They know it's just me and my assistant. So, um, but really, if you're just starting a business out, handwritten. I mean, if you have bad handwriting, then maybe. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, but even if you can just put your signature at the bottom and do a font printout, you know, I, some people, yeah, you're going to have to do a printout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean, even if you were typing it out, you could use the person's name. You could, there's still ways you can make it yes. personal. Personal. And, yeah. yeah. And one thing that we're missing out on this year is, you know, when you go to a festival or like the art fair, um, there's an experience with the person in the booth and that kind of organicness that makes people want to buy because it's it's a little bit more intimate than you know getting something at like target you know and when you're ordering on when you're ordering from artists online even though you're still supporting individual artists you can kind of lose that personal experience so anything you can do to still build that like hey we're, we're two people doing a transaction here uh will make it feel less like it's just oh this is just another pretty thing i ordered online mm -hmm. along with everything else i got on amazon and all the other big places yeah, that one um, definitely is a little bit, that's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to be personable. I, I try to put as much on my website as my own language when I'm talking about my products. And um, so, you know, with part of it, when I'm talking about my products, I try to word it. So I'm making jokes as if I would be making those jokes in person about my work, like little things to say or or hey if you're thinking about you know somebody feeling better maybe consider this get well bouquet things like that or wording the titles so much that there there's a little bit of touch of um uh, flavor or humor or something that makes it different um so that's the best i can do and i, I also have an about on my page so that people see the picture of me um, I read a, an article on Etsy one time that said one of the main things is when you're running an Etsy store, make sure it's your face and make sure that you're facing the picture. You don't want anything off because you're representing your store and people need to know that it's you. And that's the biggest selling point is people want to know, is it really handmade? Is it really just this person? And um, so that was the first thing at the top of the list as far as like selling well. And I think that goes across the board for any online presence is you really want to get your picture on there. Um, and then to kind of also talk about a lot of my Instagram and Facebook posts, whenever I'm in my posts, it just, it explodes with 
people are, you know, like, like it and share it because I'm in it, you know, I'm, I'm the artist, so I'm in it and they, they get a lot more excited. It's a, it's a real thing uh, to do that. Yeah. I think we, we like to, are the things that we purchase, we like to know a little bit about the story behind it. We get, it's, it's a little bit more personal then. So yeah. that makes yeah. total sense. Is there anything else about you know, the experience in the last six months of being online and working through the pandemic that has surprised you in a positive way? I mean, it, it, we talked about how it was all doom and gloom, but then everything took a turn. What are some other, do you have any other examples of um, unexpected positivity that happened this year for you? Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Okay, so one of the things um, that happened was during Mother's Day, um, Mother's Day seemed to be like um, pretty hard for a lot of people because they knew they weren't going to be able to see their mother in person. And um, or if they did, there was still going to be some type of distance. So um, I sold a substantial amount of bouquets just based on that same formula I told you about that kind of works for my business. Everybody's at home. They're not spending money. So they have the money. And then when it comes time um, for this experience, they want to make it a little bit more special because it's such a tough time. And um, so in that, I had put out on Facebook that I make custom bouquets. And um, so the, the great thing was that all of those bouquets were custom. Not one was um, ordered off of my site. It was like, well, she likes uh, pink roses or um, she loves red peonies and it just went on and on. And I felt so honored um, because I knew that a lot of people were just having a challenging time. And so they couldn't be there with their mom, um, but they were able to send this paper bouquet that'll last forever. And it's sort of commemorating, not just something that was going horribly wrong, but commemorating, you know, that special relationship and making it uh, move outside of that challenging real world stuff. Um, so that was, uh, that was amazing. And I felt the challenge of trying to get all those bouquets out uh, weeks ahead, but I was able to, you know, pull my assistant in for some of that. Um, and then the other thing was, I decided when I put out the free tutorial um, that I wanted to do something extra special. So each kit that I put out there, I included an additional kit. And in those kits, I, um, I put a little card that said, you know, I think everybody just needs a little bit of extra love and attention right now. So please, um, you know, make this, for, make this extra kit for somebody that you love. And um, so I got a lot of good feedback on that because you know, not a lot of people will give out free supplies and things, but I just really felt the need to do something like that because I just, my heart was already breaking for everything that was going on in the world. It was the only thing I could do um, to kind of like heal myself is to give something or do something special and make people smile. So, and they didn't know they were getting that. They, they literally opened it up and it was like Christmas, like, oh, there's two kids here. I get to make two flowers. Um, so that was a great experience for me. And honestly, since then, I've wanted to do it again because uh, it just makes me feel good to, to make people feel special. That's one of the main reasons I run the business I run. I, mm -hmm. I like doing work to make people feel good and feel special and commemorate uh, whether it was a loss or a gain uh, through getting married or, you know, birthday. So, so yeah. So jumping topics again, we're going to go back to the future, actually, because I'm going back to a topic about the future, um, because yeah. we were chatting beforehand. You have something in the works with the Franklin Park Conservatory, but I'm not sure yeah. how much you're able to say about it. What can you tell us about that? Well, thank you for bringing that up. I almost forgot about that. Um, they have requested me to do a show, and I'm in the middle of writing that proposal. So um, that proposal needs to go through, of course. And at some point, um, you know, we're looking at January to May of next year. So it's coming up on us very, very quickly. And um, that is going to be uh, the proposal I've already written is very exciting. Um, it's this will be my my third show for Paper Blooms as a company. And um, I think one of the coolest things about it is we're building um, a miniature conservatory. So um, a smaller version of like a greenhouse, a sort of conservatory, 
um, that's about 30 by 60 inches, um, 40 inches off the ground, and then um, probably about 30 bit. So pretty good size. And then I'm going to uh, put, you know, life size paper plants in it. Um, so it, it'll have lots of little details and succulents and cacti and little trees and things where you just look inside and it's a whole world of things. Um, so that'll be exciting. And of course, I'll have orchids on display and lots of wall gardens, lots of very huge installation wall gardens um, to where it really fills up the wall space. And um, so I'm just trying to bring um, that idea of, you know, having reverence for nature, you know, and recreating nature to remind us to stop and appreciate. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what the show is, is, is all about. So would it be outside or what it, is it like a greenhouse type thing that's outside? Oh, um, so so the gallery that it's going to be inside, the, the greenhouse is going to be located in there and it's just going to be sitting on a table. So it's sort of like a play on what a real greenhouse is like. And I'm, I'm going to put plants inside of it that would belong in a greenhouse, but it's just going to be uh, like a miniature version. Um, sort of playing off the idea like we're in a giant greenhouse but here's this miniature one and so cool. I think that's kind of fun yeah they're very excited about it as well and um, I just think it's going to be an amazing experience because I love the idea as I mentioned before building upon illusion um, so there are going to be some components of that show where uh, maybe it'll it'll seem like is that a real thing in the corner there or is that a paper plant? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that it'll be kind of fun just to be a part of that experience and not know um, some of the parts and pieces, like what, yeah. what it is. It reminds me of like photorealistic paintings where far away you're like, that's a photo. And then you go up close yeah. and you can see the little strokes and you're like, oh, it's, a oh yeah. it's, it's always fun to uh, have the mind tricked like that. Yep, it's very magical. And that's what I'm all about with my stuff. Absolutely, yeah. So teacher to teacher, we're coming up on the hour. I think the best place to leave the conversation might be uh, with what what would be your core advice for someone that um, is really excited about what you're doing because they want to do something similar to that and they're, but they're a little apprehensive about getting started. It's pretty daunting to think about going out there and just trying to scrape together sales and, and uh, make your way through it. So what would you say? Um, you know, I often get asked this question, and I think the thing that comes to mind the most is don't be afraid to fail. I don't know how many times I thought that, you know, I had a huge failure or I made a, an artwork that didn't work out. I mean, it's handmade, you know, and uh, so that stuff could feel challenging and feel maybe even hurtful or maybe feel like um, you are a failure. But that's not it at all. I, I've learned so much through my failures, almost so much more than the things that actually work. And um, I find the things that work through my failures. So when I come up on something that it's like, okay, that piece didn't work, um, that piece or um, that part fell, or that didn't last in those conditions, um, the heat or whatever, I just go back to the studio, go back to the drawing board and even some of the experiences I've had with venues or exhibitions, I've realized um, maybe those weren't the best to work with just based on what kind of artwork I have. If you don't have air conditioning in your space, I can't show with you because my work is, is not meant to be in a hot house <laughs> in the summer and then have fluctuating temperatures in the night. It just, you know, um, it, it's, it's not conducive for my work. My work would probably survive, but I, taking those risks wouldn't work. And I've gone through those failures and challenges uh, to know that that's what my work is a part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so definitely I, would, I wouldn't go into anything thinking I'm gonna fail. I would go into it expecting to have failures because that's the only way to come out with um, what is actually gonna work. Like you don't know until you fail. So just have the expectation and just go with it. Yeah. And those moments can be so frustrating when you find out something the hard way. Like I didn't know there was no air conditioning and it can be, <laughs> it can be really frustrating. But then over time, I'm sure you look back on that and you're like, I'm glad I learned that lesson. Now I know oh, yeah. I, I needed to know at some point, you know, and how well oh, to yeah. know. And you feel like your reputation needs to be maintained um, to a certain degree. And it does, but ultimately 
you know, these things don't ruin you, um, you know, and you don't have to go home and question yourself, why am I in office? You don't have to do that. You can just say, you know what, it's handmade and I'm human. And at the end of the day, we all do things and have experiences that we learn from. You move on and you get better. And then the next year you come out with something even better. And then it's like, it's almost as if that never even happened. It's like the presence of mind with the work you're creating now is, it's like a um, night and day. It's, it's just like, it's more and more glorious when you go through that stuff. And it builds depth in your character. I mean, I can't deny that I'm not as joyous as I am today without all the things that happened to kind of get me to this higher place of being in myself. <laughs> like it just goes without saying. I mean, everybody, uh, you know, can go through those experiences and either be um, bitter or they can uh, come out better. You get to choose. Well, Leah, thanks for being with us. Uh, you do amazing work. And I think the biggest testament to that is when I am walking around in the art fair and checking on people that around three o'clock, your table's bare and uh, you're all sold out. I, I don't think there's any better way to say what great work you're doing than that. Um, I, really appreciate that conversation and uh, being here with us. It's, you know, for students, it's such a, uh, intimidating thing to be your own business as an artist and um, it's, your advice is really helpful. Well, thank you so much and I'm so glad that I can share um, to, you know, make people come out as successful as I feel now. Like I, that means the world to me and thank you for bringing light to my work and, and sharing your, your compliments too. It's very warming. Thank you. And I can't take full credit. We got to thank uh, Nicolette Swift with Nicolette Cinemagraphics and Reese Brothers Productions. They're the ones that put on this talk. So they are behind the scenes and we thank them for allowing us to have yes. this conversation and share it with so many people. Thank you. Yes, thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate this experience. It's amazing. Thank you. All right. Thanks for tuning in. All right.